I'm Alexander Hefner, your host on The Open Mind. How much intolerance are we prepared to tolerate is a question I've repeated on this broadcast since my tenure began three years ago. I suppose our guest today, Teresa Bejan, would reply that we must keep our conversations just tolerable enough to preserve American democracy. Professor of politics at the University of Oxford, Bejan is author of a new Harvard University Press volume, Mere Civility, Disagreement and the Limits of Toleration, on which she expounded recently in the Washington Post. You don't have to be nice to political opponents, she says, but you do have to talk to them. So how do we preserve even this definition of what she calls mere civility, the baseline necessary to interact even if with mutual contempt, amid the hand-to-hand Twitter combat, what our guest calls a nasty brand of digital ad hominem invective? It's certainly true that notions of civility have furthered persecution, suppression, and exclusion from those engaged both in hate speech and protests. So now we ask Teresa how we, in her words, can cultivate anew the mental toughness to tolerate what we perceive as our opponents' incivility. Right. Well, that is, I mean, that's the $64,000 question. And I, in the book and also in the Washington Post piece, I think think a first step has to be trying to reverse this, you know, uh, retreat that's been happening for quite a long time. Um, But this retreat into these kind of like-minded enclaves where we speak only with those who agree with us uh, and really, you know, relish the much more agreeable uh, company of the like-minded. I think a first step to cultivating that mental toughness is simply to sort of take a step out of those much more comfortable uh, communities and really kind of, you know, do the difficult work of engaging those with whom we really deeply disagree. Tell us about Roger Williams and and why you think he's key to understanding civility anew in the contemporary context. Yeah, uh, Roger Williams is, as I put it um, at one point in the book, he's he's the hero. And um, Although after the account I offer, one might be a little bit you know, surprised to hear that he's a hero because I think the Roger Williams that is known um, to Americans and I mean, w- 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 while acknowledging that Roger Williams is much less known to Americans than some of the other people that I discuss in the book, like John Locke and Thomas Hobbes, but Roger Williams is known as the founder of Rhode Island. Uh, he is known as a kind of early hero of conscience. He was exiled from Massachusetts Bay Colony by his fellow Puritans, uh, and he founded what would become uh, the colony of Rhode Island, uh, uh, Providence Plantations, um, on land uh, given to him by the Narragansett tribe. Um, so, you know, the, insofar as he's known, Williams is kind of extolled as a hero of conscience, of free speech, of, you know, uh, American religious liberty. Um, but one of the things that I point out in the book is that, in a way, this really um, doesn't do justice to just how interesting and also how frustrating <laughs> Roger Williams could be. He was one of this uh, early generation of immigrants to the New World who fled England because of his Puritanism, which was um, coming under pressure within the Church of England. But as soon as he arrived um, in Massachusetts Bay, his reputation as a young man of brilliance and godliness had preceded him. And the elders of the Massachusetts Church came to him and said, Master Williams, we would love it if you would become teacher in our in our church, which is a huge honor, right? You know, I'm sure you know many young people have graduated from universities today and are finding it difficult to get employment would sort of say, oh wow, this is an amazing, amazing opportunity. But Williams unceremoniously turns it down on the grounds that even the Puritan church of Massachusetts Bay is not pure. It's polluted because it's not formally separated from the Church of England. So basically he rejects the off- job offer and in the process insults the people who've made the offer by saying, you are polluted by your spiritual uh, conversation with the unregenerate. And it's that kind of intolerance, that spiritual intolerance that I find so fascinating about Williams. How did a man so convinced of others' errors nevertheless found the most tolerant society that the world had ever seen in in Rhode Island. And how did he do that? Well, so the story I tell is a story of someone who is uncompromising in spiritual matters, absolutely uncompromising. I say in the book, you know, by the end of his life, he was so skeptical of other salvation that he he, he would worship in a congregation only of two 
him and his wife. And, you know, he's not entirely sure about her. Um, but that spiritual exactingness goes hand in hand with a sense of the fallenness and inevitable corruption of this world and a really sort of frank and clear eyed realization that one has to live together with idolaters in this world if one would live at all. And it's that it's that combination of recognizing that one has a duty to witness against the errors of others, to call them out, to sort of, as he says, to sound the silver alarms against sin and against error, but nevertheless remain committed to living together um, in civil society, uh, to speaking to each other, and indeed to evangelizing one another. Um, so that's what's, I think, really distinctive about Williams, um, not simply in the 17th century, but indeed even today in the 21st. I think that, that that's a combination that a lot of us find it difficult to wrap our heads around, but I think it's precisely the combination that we, that we need. Would you say that, you, that the incivility today in terms of that inability to have agreeable or at least tol tolerably agreeable civil discussion, would you say that that is the historical precedent of the American experience? Or would you say that this is an outlier? Mm. Right, so one of, the, um, one of the questions that came up immediately in writing the book, as I was kind of engaging with um, other current um, writers on civility and, and, and more specifically on the supposed crisis of civility that's afflicting the American Republic. I mean, at the time I was very, uh, very sensitive to the, to the claims of what, who, those I call the civility skeptics, basically. You know, the claim that our crisis of civility is somehow unprecedented um, usually depends on a kind of uh, ignorance about the true tenor of public discourse in previous uh, historical periods. You know, and complaints about a crisis of civility really are as old as the American Republic itself. Now, that being said, I think that we need to be skeptical of claims to, you know, unprecedented levels of anything in public discourse. That being said, I do think that we are in a period of um, finding disagreement particularly um, unpleasant and threatening, that there is, there is something to the perception that, you know, that there is a kind of crisis of civility. But then what we mean by civility when we say there's a crisis of civility. That's what I'm really interested in. And that, I think, um, that the sense that you know, our disagreements are becoming more and more threatening because we feel as though we've lost the kind of shared foundation upon which disagreement can take place in a tolerant society. That, I think, is very, very closely akin to the problems and the challenges that we're facing people in the 16th and 17th centuries, um, in this period when there was a fluorescence not only of religious difference, but of religious disagreement, and indeed of a lot of uncivil speech surrounding religious disagreements. So the question of how you coexist under those conditions is one, I think, that really is eerily familiar to us. And to say that our crisis is not unprecedented is not to deny that it's a crisis, but I think that it can then help us recognize that perhaps there are resources in the past for thinking through our own challenges. And so if you talk about a crisis of incivility, you're talking about the Civil War. You're not, you're not talking about 17th, 18th century. So here I think that um, one of the things that I want to push back against in going to the 17th century and saying that it can offer 21st century insights is precisely this kind of hard and fast distinction between those differences that are religious on the one hand and those differences that are political on the other hand. And precisely the way I want to allied that distinction is by pointing out the similar dynamics of believing and belonging that are implicit in both religious and political disagreements. So I think that one of the, one of the trends that I've certainly noticed in my lifetime, um, and that really informed the writing of the book, is the extent to which um, Americans often view politics as a matter of being on the right side taking sides and then knowing who's on the wrong side, right? And that dynamic of kind of purity on the one hand, saying I'm in the right, I'm with the angels, and you there, my opponents are on the side of the devils. <laughs> That's the dynamic that I'm really interested in. And there I think that, you know, we can 
in a way, we can sort of, um, we're sort of guilty of, a, of, of downplaying the differences in two respects. So just in the 17th century, religious disagreements absolutely led to wars of swords. <laughs> all the time. I mean, the, the threat of religious violence was very real. I mean, Guy Fawkes proved that the, th the threat of Catholic terrorism was real enough. Um, and there are armed uprisings, uprisings in London in the 1660s, um, led, by, uh, led by people who you know, were saying that the apocalypse is nigh. Over 40 people died. And, this is, you know, and then there are sort of long-standing religious wars in France and also uh, the continuing oppression in Ireland. And so violence is real there. But also the extent to which um, our political disagreements today have this kind of sectarian tenor of it doesn't even sort of matter so much of, you know, getting something done or coming to an agreement. What matters is this politics of purity. Let's not become, uh, let's not become polluted by uh, associating ourselves with uh, errors that we deem damnable. How do you view religion as um, either advancing or injuring the cause of civility now, right now? There are a couple things um, that I want to be clear on. I mean, so one is just to say that in the 17th century, religious disagreements are political disagreements because right. they go to the question of, you know, how we organize the church state. And, you know, it's, I live in England now. It's important to remember that, you know, there's an established church in England to this day. In a, in, a, in a society that thinks of itself as secular. But another point is simply to say that I think that um, I'm not saying that political disagreements have become religious disagreements. What I am saying is that there's a kind, the, the kind of sectarian mentality that sees um, political questions as being of fundamental existential significance. And I think you notice this in, in, in the 2016 election and, and, and in the aftermath, you've seen a lot of implicitly and explicitly apocalyptic rhetoric that says, you know, basically the end is nigh, you know, the Antichrist, <laughs> the Antichrist is risen. I mean, so I think there's a way in which um, we can exaggerate the distance from, of our own worlds from the past by saying, oh, we are secular, they're not. In a way, I think that it's, it's not really, that's not really the question. It's about how human beings understand these questions of believing and belonging and how they define themselves in opposition to um, those with whom they disagree and then see themselves as engaged in a kind of fundamental existential battle. The religious has, the framework, the kind of underpinning of, of how those existential questions yeah. guide us has hijacked questions of public policy and the political process. Right. But it's not clear that there's any real foundation of theology or faith that is determinative in how we're getting to those decisions. In other words, there's the apocalypse, but there's not the Bible. There's not a guiding creed that has any logical, theological uh, basis or any historical theological basis. Oh, that's well, so I, I would say that there's plenty of creedal politics. Uh, in a, I mean, so isn't, I, I, you know, isn't well, secular liberalism its, I mean, its own creed? <laughs> well, that's true, but I, I guess I'm, 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 I'm asking you constructively. Yeah. Religion in this country, whether it was the abolitionist movement, mm. has been also a force for social change and social justice. Absolutely. And so I'm, I'm wondering from you, where is the potential for a pro-social mm. religious being right. to guide us to inform a, a mere civility that can be constructive? Right. Oh, that's, yeah, fantastic. Um, so I think that it's right to say that political disagreement, you should just be hardline about this distinction between political disagreements that are meant to be conducted on the basis of kind of shared norms of evidence and, you know, not appeal to certain sacred texts. I mean, 
I grant that distinction. Although I think oftentimes we can exaggerate the, uh, the extent to which our own creeds are sort of rationally founded as opposed to things that we adopt in a kind of identitarian way. You know, I'm a secular liberal, ergo I'm committed to these principles that I hold to be self-evident and sacred and I will fight. <laughs> I will fight for those. And I think that that's valuable. I think that, you know, that liberalism should be a fighting creed. But, um, but what worries me is a kind of this increasing sense of a kind of politics of purity that says that what matters most is making sure that, you know, my side is presented in its most purified and um, righteous way as if, you know, because once we enter into the political domain, it's a domain of compromise. It's a domain of, you know, rubbing along together and suffering and sort of putting up, putting up with those things and those people that we don't really like. And I think if you see a way in which American politics has become increasingly dysfunctional, I think that's a clear, that's a clear case where, you know, we can see about this, this politics of purity that leads to increasing polarization in Right. Congress so it, it would strike me sphere. that impurity. Right. That, I don't mean to answer my own question, but what is the, the constructive force can be the impurity or the acknowledgement of... Of the fallenness of our condition of living together. Or, or you being more learned than, than I, or your pastor or your teacher, right. being able to, or your countrymen, being able to impart something that you might not experience. Right, so the, and that's wonderful. So it's the, you know, the, there's a kind of hope for and a counsel to epistemic humility that says, you know, surely a first step to this has to be recognizing the limitedness of our own perspective and the fact that we have things to learn from others, to have a uh, open mind, right. as you might say. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, and I think that that's absolutely crucial. It's absolutely important. But it's not, I don't know that it's sufficient to cure what ails us. And I think that there may be a place, and this is the kind of counterintuitive position I argue in the book, there may be a place for a more evangelical understanding <laughs> of our political positions that is convinced of the righteousness of our own views, but nevertheless sees the task as addressing them and trying to convince our opponents of them. Right. right. Instead of just preaching to the converted to open up again and say, actually, if I believe myself to be so righteous, surely a consequence of that should be a kind of commitment to talking. Right. Well, I've others. said before, there is a kind of incivility of obstructionism. There's a mm. kind of incivility of dysfunction in the political process today. You write, mere civility demands that we keep the disagreement going no matter how disagreeable I've also talked about disagreeably agreeing, which I think is what you're, what you're getting <laughs> yeah. at here, to continue the battle of words without resorting to violence. So what, what do you see as, when you talk about the criteria for mere civility, or, and we spent too little time with Keith Bybee discussing this, so now we have five minutes to, to talk about it with you, but what, what can we collectively agree is mere civility? You're based in Britain, and so... Prime Minister's questions, I think, is an apt example of mere civility, right? Yes, yes exactly. I, I, that has been one of the ironies of my academic career. As, as an American now teaching in Britain, I see um, Prime Minister's questions and also uh, debate in Parliament as exemplary cases of mere civility, things that I'd like to see more of in the United States. Um, Explain. What do you see? Right. So I think that the first thing to be really clear on is what we mean by civility. So civility generally, you know, for, for all of our sort of hand waving and pearl clutching about a loss of civility, people are often not very forthcoming with what they think civility actually is. So civility seems to be a conversational virtue that's meant to govern disagreement and particularly govern disagreement in a, in a tolerant society, i.e. one that's committed to, to, to tolerating difference. Um, mere civility then is a particular way of construing that virtue. And mere civility, as I define it in the book, is a virtue, it's a minimal conformity to the norms of respectful behavior, sufficient to keep a conversation going. So what's really important about this is that um, oftentimes when we talk about civility, it can sound very aspirational. For instance, when President Obama made civility a sort of central theme of his presidency, it was always a, in a kind of high, it's, it was a high tone of aspiration, civility as a kind of commitment to um, political friendship, mutual respect, and indeed an open mind, whereas mere civility is a floor, 
not a ceiling. Right. It, so how does that play out in the House of Commons? So or, what Parliament? it means is that uh, you are often going to express your disagreements uh, in a full-throated full-throated way uh, that, you know, expresses what you take to be the righteousness of your views. It may mean that you often use language that is intended to be or not intended to be insulting. Um, now, mere civility is not a counsel to insult. It actually says that often ad hominem attacks are a very good way of kind of cutting off disagreement and trying to define people out of the discussion. Um, but mere civility says that in the face of such insulting speech, one nevertheless has to remain in the conversation. And there you see, for something that seems quite minimal, it actually becomes really very demanding because remaining committed to talking to those one, see one sees as kind of irredeemably right. mistaken is difficult enough. Those to whom we find it you know, difficult or even impossible to respect, that's hard enough. Maintaining a commitment to conversation in the face of language that we, that we see as insulting, putting up with that, that's also really difficult. Right. So mere civility actually makes as many demands, perhaps even more, of listeners than it does of speakers. In his farewell address, President Obama actually encouraged a far more practical notion of civility and try talking to someone in person, yeah. get off the web. And it strikes me that, again, aptly positioned from the British and American perspective, you know, there are some volatile, vigorous disagreements in Parliament, and if you watch Prime Minister's questions, you get all of the different constituencies, but th there's a humor, a, a good-hearted, a good-hearted villain yeah. is better than a, you know, a malicious, uh, Machiavellian villain. Isn't that part of the difference here? And, and yeah, that's really nice. It's, it's, um, it's the fact of routinely engaging with in, in a very, in, in oftentimes in language that is heated and hateful. <laughs> But nevertheless, the sort of the continued practice of disagreeing with and speaking with those whom you oppose, right, and those whom you understand yourself in opposition to. And what really worries me in um, American public discourse, and I actually would point to as I think one of the things that has changed and has made disagreement more uncivil, is paradoxically the kind of, you know, as debate online becomes more and more vitriolic, that's a consequence of the fact that people are, for the most part, cloistering themselves in like-minded enclaves in which they then let loose on their opponents on the assumption that, the, you know, that they're only speaking with people that, that agree with them already. Or alternatively, if you do sort of uh, let loose on someone with whom you disagree in the comment section on a blog, you never really expect a kind of, you never respect, expect a response back. And so there's a way in which incivility becomes purely expressive as opposed to communicative, right? right? So sort of venting my, you know, venting my spleen, mm -hmm. as opposed to actually, you know, trying to change the mind of someone that I think is really culpably in the wrong. I point to, we're wrapping up here, but I point to the example of, of discourse as being more fun, charming, oh, you know, across the pond, but also the constituencies that are represented in a parliamentary system, which is noteworthy if you're not familiar with the British context and are watching prime minister's questions, you feel like you have ownership in those debates because it's not just the D and the R, the mm. Democrat and the Republican. Uh, and therefore, there is more civil, uh, free spirit. Th there is something in the parliamentary system, I think, that mm. Um, gives people a greater opportunity or affinity for civility, I think. Interesting. I, I mean, I do think that people find it easier to feel they have skin in the game um, and that they have some, some real way of getting in touch with their representatives. Um, but partly that just has to do with the fact that Britain is a much smaller country. And here I'm going to make a, you know, a, a, as an American in exile, you know, sing a peon to my, to my homeland and say that American two-party democracy is a really wonderful and actually miraculous thing. <laughs> if pressed, you know, this is not the system that you would 
design, but every system has its deficiencies, every, every system has its problems. And I think that um, given just the amazing tightwire act that the American Republic is, a country on this scale, this geographically and culturally and ethnically um, heterogeneous, the fact that we rub along together is pretty impressive. <laughs> And so I think that looking back then to the period in which the ideas on which our nation are really founded are getting worked out, not the 18th century, although I have all, all the love possible for, you know, for the 18th century and my friends who are scholars of it, but the 17th century, when they're really hashing out what it means to live side by side with someone that you think worships the devil on terms of equal liberty. That's really counterintuitive. That's not, that's not the solution you'd come to if you actually think uncivil disagreement is a problem. But nevertheless, I think it's the right solution. I think it's a valuable and precious solution. And I, you know, what I want most of all is my countrymen to really, to sort of, to love themselves again and to think about, you know, what, what's fantastic about the American system. But it does mean kind of alienating ourselves from some of our assumptions about what a civil conversation looks and like. And you have to wonder if Roger Williams would see us rubbing together or <laughs> I don't know what the metaphor would be. Right. Teresa, Rub thank you for being with me here today. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. And thanks to you in the audience. I hope you join us again next time for another thoughtful excursion into the world of ideas. Until then, keep an open mind. Please visit the Open Mind website at 13.org slash Open Mind to view this program online or to access over 1,500 other interviews. And do check us out on Twitter and Facebook at Open Mind TV for updates on future programming. Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from Anne Olnick, Joan Gans Cooney, the Angelson Family Foundation, Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, with special thanks to the Schumann Media Center for additional support, and to the corporate community Mutual of America.